what are we going to do today? As I said at the outset, we're going to hopefully get done and dusted in about 45 minutes or so. So I'll give a very quick overview in the next slide as to why we're here and what we're doing. Then I'll hand over to the bulk of our presentation to, to Andy, who's going to take us through some really, really useful tips for flying in the summer holiday season. All sorts of things. It's not just hot weather. There's all sorts of other little hazards out there that can get us. And it's really, really a good um, idea to sit down before the holiday season really gets underway, just to put some of these in the back pocket. Um, I'll do a quick wrap up with a few key points that we can summarise, of course. And if we have any time left, and hopefully we have a few minutes left anyway, we might be able to expand on some questions or discussions with Andy before we uh, before we conclude. So if everyone's kind of happy about that, I'll just now flick over to an overview where I just want to paint the the scene because we scratched our heads a number of oh, about a month ago saying, well, what would be a really good webinar before everyone goes on holidays? And I thought to myself, well, maybe we should look at something about summer flying with some of the hazards that can be that can be um, faced by aviators flying in the heat of the Australian summer. Uh, many private and recreational pilots, of course, perhaps don't fly as often as they'd like throughout the bulk of the year, but we get to the we get to the end of the year in the summer holiday period and everyone dusts off the old headsets and and and, and jumps in the aircraft. So I think a, a seminar that looks at this type of stuff, especially at this time of year, can certainly, certainly be of use. Basically, summer makes great flying weather. You know, let's face it, it, it's a great time to be flying. We have friendly terrain by and large in Australia. We have warm temperatures and our daylight hours are, are of course, extended. And um, we often have an absence of poor weather for extended periods. So summer is a great time to go flying throughout a lot of the country. But there are some unique hazards that we all need to be aware of. Um, and the impact that those hazards can have on the safety of what we're actually going to do. And it can adversely you know, Im impact on things like the performance of our aircraft in the, in the hot summer weather, um, our physiological state when it comes to things like dehydration and fatigue, which can be um, which can be adversely impacted, especially in the hot summer weather. And of course, the environment in which we fly can adversely impact on the safety of what we're doing. So we're talking about here things not just like hot summer temperatures, but things like thunderstorms, turbulence, um, density altitudes, and all those types of things that we need to think about. So it's a, it's a really good idea to, to just have a look at this stuff before we, before we go flying over the holidays. And a good understanding, or at least an awareness of these hazards and the risks they pre present to us is a really vital component to safe operations in the heat of the Australian summer. Um, so without further ado, what I'm going to do, if everyone's happy, and I think you've seen that photo before, that's just a typical Australian summer outback <laughs> pear strip. I like, I, like the, uh, I like the terminal, Andy. It's probably just a little tin shack with a chair. Um, yeah. What I'm going to do now is hand over to Andy, and Andy will um, just introduce himself. As I said at the outset, um, he's a, certainly a respected industry member with a huge amount of experience in the GA sector. And um, there was no one better to turn to when we were having a chat about this type of thing. So it's my absolute pleasure now to introduce Andy and I'll ask Andy if you can take control of the machine and you should be good to go. Very good. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very, very much, Tim. And uh, thanks too to CASA uh, for the uh, opportunity to um, share a little bit of uh, what summer flying have meant to me uh, over the course of the last 45 years uh, of flying small GA aircraft. And, you know, really, when we think about summertime flying, there's so many things. Uh, we could be heading home from the bush, having done some work. We could be taking the kids off somewhere for school holidays. Perfect time, as Tim pointed out, um, to head off and do some things. And it certainly brings about some very memorable flying. Um, and uh, so my purpose today is to encourage you to get out and go flying and, and do the summer flying safely uh, and uh, effectively and enjoyably. Um, and uh, so I'm going to try and draw your attention um, to a couple of things that will make it only more safe and more enjoyable, uh, which is the key point. You know, the, the, the most important message of the whole presentation, I think, is 
to stop and think about who we are as general aviation pilots and what we do. Because at the end of the day, it's what we do in the aircraft that actually makes the difference. We as pilots, more than anyone else, are the ones who can positively impact general aviation safety. So that's a key uh, message that I hope um, you're uh, uh, happy to absorb. Um, <clears throat> We're not going to spend much time about me. There's some very happy places that I've been. And then in the bottom left hand corner, an unhappy place uh, where poor old Bankstown Airport covered in fog on a uh, warm summer morning. Um, I've been around uh, flying uh, aeroplanes and things actually really since 78, but 79 I started flying for real. Um, and, and you know, I've been very, very fortunate. It, it's thousands of the most enjoyable and fulfilling hours of my life uh, being able to fly, um, particularly in regional Australia. And uh, I uh, have owned aircraft net for 35 years, uh, and I'm lucky enough now to uh, have a few um, roles associated with uh, advocating um, general aviation uh, on behalf of the general aviation community. So uh, with that said, and, and, and some of those things put away, let's move on and have a bit of a talk about what we're really going to be doing when we do flying. At the end of the day, general aviation flying, we, we, we have the huge benefit of flexibility. What really makes it work for us is that we can come and go as we please. We can set our own time frames. If the weather doesn't go well, well, we can do something else. And, and if you compare that situation, say, to our cousins who are flying Boeings and Airbuses, um, they don't get those choices most of the time. Most of the time they have to choose uh, to continue and they're under great pressure to finish flights uh, because of the need for schedule and reliability. We don't have that. Conversely, we have smaller aircraft and we are much more susceptible to the weather. So the most important thing, I think, in preparing for a flight is to set the expectations of those who are going to be travelling with you and those who are waiting for you to arrive. And you can set those expectations by being across the big picture of your flight uh, long before you set off. So four to seven days away, go through and look at some of that prognostic information. Um, the Bureau has an awful lot on its website um, from which you can draw uh, a great deal of information. Uh, interactive weather, the MEDI, uh, if, if you're in uh, the far north, uh, the cyclone advisories, and just the good old four-day um, mean several uh, prognosis will give you a lot of information about how the weather is going to go uh, on the flight that you're about to conduct. In the summertime, it's even more important because the very high temperatures and the rapid movement of the fronts can mean that we can have changeable weather, particularly in the coastal regions, uh, more than we normally would see, say, through the stable period of winter. So it's very important uh, to try and get across um, what the weather is doing uh, well before the flight commences. On the day of the flight, and I recommend the day before, um, it's a good idea to try and get a, a, just an idea of what's going to be happening uh, at the point of departure. And if you're departing from a capital city, a great tool that is so underutilised is the fact that the capital cities have the 24 and 30 hour TAFs. So you can have a look at that, say, on a Saturday afternoon for a Sunday morning departure, and it's likely to give you a pretty clear indication of what's going on, even if you're not departing from that airport, even if you're departing, uh, say, from the Metropolitan Secondary Airport nearby. So you might be heading out of Essendon or uh, Moorabbin. Um, there's no harm at all. In fact, I'd I strongly encourage everyone have a look at those uh, 24 and 30 hour TAFs for Melbourne uh, to see what the weather's got in store. Uh, similarly, the aerodrome warnings, the airport weather briefings, and then on the morning itself, a look at the weather radars from whichever source you choose to get them um, is, is a very good idea. If you've got questions, don't hesitate to utilise that um, telephone number at the bottom of the uh, graphical aviation forecast, the, the forecast for um, uh, for the area that gives us that information uh, uh, it, down the bottom there, there's uh, a, a telephone number for Forecaster. And if you do use it, make sure you've read the standard materials first uh, and then um, be clear about what questions you've got and what you want to do. But um, that service is there and it can be very, very useful. Um, there's lots of other information as well available through the EFB apps. And of course, just remember that this background briefing that you're going to give yourself, none of that um, replaces uh, a complete uh, pre-flight uh, briefing that um, you must obtain uh, under the regulations. 
So when we do this background briefing, and, and let's just pause for a minute and think about why we're going to do this. Well, if we if we have an idea, say, on Tuesday about the feasibility of a flight on Saturday, and it turns out that it's a VFR flight, and that in the course of the VFR flight, we're going to be having to deal with some significant uh, rain showers, uh, perhaps along the route, or we're going to be facing uh, some very strong winds uh, where we're trying to do a crossing over the mountains, then we've got the opportunity to consider rescheduling. And it doesn't always have to push it back. Sometimes you can cheer up the whole family by saying, guess what, guys, we're going on holiday a day early. But you definitely should try to take advantage. And I've found this all the way through. Uh, the the benefits of being able to uh, be flexible and uh, be able to take advantage of the opportunity to be able to move uh, the schedule to suit um, flyable weather. What are we looking for? Well, we're looking for fronts um, is the first thing. And, and, and fronts, of course, are associated with wind and showers uh, and convective cloud and those prefrontal troughs that come through, which are going to bring significant changes um, to the wind. Um, it's also a good idea. And, and, you know, we've got this idea in Australia that every time there's a great big high pressure system on the East Coast, we're in for good weather. Well, that's partly true, but it also doesn't guarantee that there won't be coastal showers, and then more often than not, there are. So when we see those high pressure ridges forming, and especially near the coastal areas, we should be paying attention and looking out for um, the potential for uh, rain showers. And also, don't overlook um, the uh, prevalence of onshore winds in those conditions, which uh, can affect, for example, the crosswind on a north-south runway if the winds are coming in um, straight out of the east. When you see the bunched up isobars, of course, we all know to be thinking about um, mechanical turbulence and, and having a look at those areas of high and low pressure, you can form your own little forecast about which way the wind is going to go, remembering that in the southern hemisphere, the wind flows clockwise around a low and in the um, uh, and and it flows anti-clockwise around a high. And if you have trouble remembering that, an easy one for me is if it's an anti-cyclone, it's anti-clockwise. And if it's a low, it's a cyclone and it runs clockwise. Um, and of course, those that little rule is only true in the Southern Hemisphere. If you go flying in North America, it works the other way around. Um, in Eastern and Central Australia, we've got to always remember that the northwesterly winds are going to generally be quite warm and you can expect higher temperatures and the southerly winds when they prevail typically will bring uh, the colder air. And uh, the temperatures, of course, are always important, but particularly the high temperatures that we're seeing in some of the east coast locations uh, even today. Uh, high temperatures and high humidity, uh, then it, it's highly likely, uh, it, it becomes more, much more likely for us to see um, thunderstorms forming. Um, a, a, a very good tool for pilots to use in thinking about the conditions in summer is to be aware of the difference between the ambient temperature and the dew point, or put another way, pay attention to the relative humidity. Remember that when the dew point and the ambient temperature are the same, and if there are clouds, it will rain. And if there are no clouds in the morning, especially you can expect fog. So being aware of uh, changing levels of humidity uh, in the warmer weather is, um, is, is, is very valuable. Um, when you do have a look at those uh, uh, projected briefings or, or these, these four to seven day briefings, as I'm uh, encouraging everyone to do, um, just re recall that the computer generated charts do not necessarily show uh, the position of features such as fronts and ridges and troughs. So uh, it's important to make sure that you know what you're working with and pay attention. The um, We talked about, about what, what it is to be a pilot to actually get uh, a flying mission accomplished to do something and it's it's the 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 importance of the outcome is exactly the same whether you're taking the family in the plane for a picnic by the coast or whether you're off to do some work uh you might be a vet uh, or a doctor off to do some work in a regional location the, the the critical issues for us as pilots is to be aware that we can do all the forecasting and all the planning we like but sometimes things just don't go our way and when they don't go our way, 
I've always found that the most valuable thing is to make the decisions early. And it doesn't matter whether you're VFR or IFR. These considerations in a small aeroplane are the same. You always have to have an option to divert and need to think about if there's to be a diversion, then which way am I going to go? Will it be left or right? Am I going to descend or climb or maintain the current altitude? And, and what is a safe and legal altitude for this segment? And it's going to be a lot more than just thinking about 500 feet above the terrain in a non-populous area. Uh, you need to make sure you're considering obstacles, uh, the ranges, the effects of uh, strong winds over the hills. These things are all important considerations. And, and, I, and I'd ask you, urge you, encourage you, um, what you do in the course of changing weather won't just change the course of your life, but it will also affect everybody in the aircraft with you and people who are on the ground. And, and that's why I mentioned before, be open to the idea that, well, you know, we might not be able to go on Saturday, but if we go on Friday, we're going to be ahead of the front and we'll be gone long before it becomes a factor. And if we choose to wait, then bear in mind that for VFR flight, we may have to wait two, maybe even three days to get flyable weather. And if it's an IFR flight, we should be prepared to put up with as much as a 24 hour delay. Um, we always must be able to understand the uh, capabilities of our aircraft and our own experience and currency as pilots. You know, if, if it's um, a flight uh, being undertaken in the summer and we're a bit rusty on crosswinds, then you might take the very responsible decision and say, well, I'm not going to go to an aerodrome that hasn't got a cross strip, or I'm not going to go if the surface winds are greater than 18 knots. They're all good choices um, that a pilot uh, making trips in summer might choose to make. Um, and, and I guess this is where this whole concept of personal minimums comes into it. What, what are the conditions that I'm happy to fly in? And we can come to some of that in a second. Um, you almost certainly these days will be using an EFB uh, when setting off and flying around in summer, and it's a wonderful tool. The changing uh, terminal area forecasts and the MET reports uh, along the way is, is just fantastic information to have in the aircraft, way, way better than we used to have, say, 30 years ago when you'd be asking uh, the flight service officer to read them out to you. Now, now we can just look on the iPad and it's all there. And, and similarly, to be able to see ground-based weather and satellite-detected lightning, um, this is a, a very severe thunderstorm that passed through uh, Cessnock uh, one um, very warm summer afternoon. And um, the happy news is there is that um, we chose to remain on the ground at Cessnock till it was gone. Um, but also we can access the weather cam uh, on the uh, in the EFB, in the electronic flight bag, and also gain uh, alerts and updates for um, SIGMET, AIRMET, and the Meta Spethi products uh, from the Bureau. And 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 that, that part is, is very important too. I, I do urge uh, all pilots not to overlook the importance of AIRMET. Uh, the AIRMET is the way that the GAF will be updated uh, in the normal course of events. So be aware of the need to be across air mets. Um, combining the EFB weather with the things we know from our own surroundings, for example, we can look at the outside air temperature, we look at the on, en route winds, and um, we're able to get a very clear picture of what's going on. But probably the most important tool to use in judging the weather en route is the Mark 1 eyeball, is actually being able to look outside and see how, how far can I really see? Uh, can it, is the visibility sufficient for me to maintain VFR? Uh, am I able to see building uh, weather in the distance far enough away that I can actually make some good choices to get around it uh, or perhaps to wait out the passage um, of, a, of a thunderstorm and then uh, continue on after that? These are all things that we have to open our eyes and be looking outside as well. So don't get carried away with the... Um, don't get carried away with the EFB. Have a look at, um, uh, make sure you're looking outside uh, and, and assessing the weather for yourself as well. And of course, don't, very, very important. And we've all, well, many of us, I'm sure, have had this happen to us. Um, we've got the EFB. We're in a lovely aeroplane with a clear canopy above us that's got the sun beaming down inside. And we've got a nice bottle of cold water that we're sipping on to keep ourselves good. And then the EFB completely stops. And of course, it stops because it's got too hot. The black surface of the screen on it has had the sun beaming down on it. Temperature's gone berserk. Um, and, and, and all I'm saying to you is, if the EFB is your only way of connect of getting that information, then make sure there's a backup as well, um, because there has to be a plan if the EFB stops working. 
So um, let's quickly talk about the worst hazards. Probably the first one and the most topical one of the last few years has been summer bushfires. And it's we, we talk about smoke, we say smoke, but what is really going on is the particles from those burning timber is combining with moisture in humid conditions. And that's what's really causing the poor visibility and continuing into severe uh, in, in, into deteriorating vis visibility um, can end up leaving particularly a VFR pilot with absolutely no way out. Great care needs to be taken, for example, uh, in a situation like the one at the top here where you can see into the distance the smoke uh, is getting thicker and deteriorating closer to the ground. Uh, and quite obviously, aerodromes that are beneath in those valleys uh, are unlikely uh, to be uh, usable. Um, the um, other thing to be aware of, as Tim and Tim mentioned, this is high temperatures. So effects on dense, density altitude, um, the aircraft's takeoff, climb, and landing performance will be impaired. But but you can also expect you're probably going to lose a couple of knots in cruise too. If you're used to cruising around um, at, um, uh, at at or close to ISA and it's now gone to the uh, standard atmosphere temperature plus say 15 or more 20, uh, the aircraft isn't going to go as fast either. And Probably the most important thing that we can do about this, the, the thing that we can actually help about this is to um, make sure that the aircraft weight and balance is done correctly. So uh, it, it's important all the time, but it's absolutely critical if the weather is hot and the aircraft's climb performance isn't going to be spectacular. Uh, any uh, mistakes made during the aircraft weight and balance uh, part of flight planning are going to be amplified uh, by the in the troubles that uh, are likely to follow. So they're critical things. And also don't overlook um, carburetor icing. I, I, I've had personal experience of this and I think this is one that many people uh, are inclined to um, uh, cast aside in summer. You say, well, how can anything ice up in summer? But, but in reality, a 26 degree day and 40% humidity puts us bang in the moderate uh, icing um, uh, carburetor icing risk uh, range and of course that doesn't just affect descents that can also affect uh, carburetor icing in crews so pay close attention to that possibility um, hey, andy andy can you just Tim. go back to that previous slide where you had those photos those photos of the bushfire smoke yeah um we spoke yesterday andy that top, oh, yes. that top photo that what that's from about what ten thousand feet that's right that's right that's right tim so so getting getting down lower into it uh, yeah. is not is not is not a place you want to play. Uh, you can see in the bottom one there it was getting a little closer to Melbourne and the and the situation was improving uh, with quite a division there, probably caused by uh, an air uh, 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 an airflow uh, 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 an easterly airflow coming in yep. from over the coast. But um, yes, uh, you can see that the point there I'm trying to make is getting down into that is um is is not going to work. Uh, Probably not under the IFR either. Yeah. Uh, and um, and the other point that I should have made, Tim, is for for, for all of our guests, where there's smoke, there's fire. If um, yep. there's fire, there are firefighters, and firefighters will be out in fixed wing and rotary uh, aircraft um, doing water bombing. And um, this is not a time for negotiation or to see if you can slide your way into an airport somewhere else yeah, from the west well, or something. Stay well away. Get out of the way. Yes, this is this is time to get out of there. Yeah, and and read no tams too. And and do always have a look at the no tams. Critical. Yeah, and um, um, Jane just sent me a little message saying the Bureau of Met, they've just brought out inf an information sheet on their website about um, bushfire smoke and and vertical and horizontal visibility. So that would be also good to look into. But there you go. The, I just thought I'd. No, in. thank you, Tim. And 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 Tim makes an excellent point. There is so much material in the aviation se section of the Bureau of Met's uh, website, and I really encourage all of our uh, attendees today to get in there and have a good look. Another hazard to um, think about is sun glare, and uh, it's especially uh, an issue in the summer weather because of the extra time, extra daylight time um, that we've got available. Um, so use good sunglasses and uh, try and avoid getting headaches. Uh, drink plenty of water, but um, also get 
uh, some quality non-polarizing sunglasses so that you can see the instrument panel and outside effectively. Um, they'll help you sight the traffic, but you must accept that in the haze, traffic can be very hard to sight. Even traffic three miles away can be almost impossible uh, against an overcast. So make sure that um, you're doing everything you can to minimize that risk of traffic and avoid takeoffs and landings into the sun low on the horizon at sunset and sunrise. The, the, particularly the landings into a setting sun, uh, as often happens in westerly conditions in eastern Australia when we're uh, trying to land um, uh, into the wind, uh, the sun is setting and, and it can be a complete blind um, operation um, that won't end well. So um, plan the arrival uh, well before uh, sunset and uh, make sure that uh, you can uh, carry out that landing without having to worry about uh, dealing with that hazard as well. And of course, look after yourself too. This is the other thing. Um, dehydration, fatigue, tiredness, not sleeping well, uh, these things can cause trouble. And think about what you're doing in the day in your job as a pilot, as a, a whether it's a private pilot taking the family for holidays or whether you're employed as a charter pilot. Think about the activities on the ground before the flight you're doing, especially a pre-flight in the burning sun outside, maybe an hour before departure, then loading the aircraft, then loading fuel, then taxiing the aircraft in the heat, it is quite possible that you can be dehydrated and fatigued before you've even taken off. And uh, the best solution to that is to drink plenty of water, have a good sleep. And of course, with small aeroplanes in the warm weather, the best tip I can give anyone is start early. The earlier we start in the morning, the earlier we finish. We can be in the hotel, feet in the pool, having your favourite beverage in the mid-afternoon when everyone else is out there battling uh, convective turbulence. Traffic uh, is much higher in the summer weather, and that's because the weather is good enough to go flying. So everywhere there will be aircraft in the uh, circuit. And um, bear in mind that not, always, not every aircraft will be the same as your aircraft. Um, uh, for example, you might be a helicopter pilot and there will be uh, an extra number of fixed wing aircraft in that circuit and, and vice versa. So uh, be aware and looking out. There could be gyroplanes. Um, there could be all sorts of things. And they Air traffic will tend to concentrate around features um, that are interesting and attractive, such as coastal towns. Um, also, be aware of uh, parachutists, especially in the coastal locations, um, and speak up, have a plan and communicate it. Slow yeah. down. Sorry, Andy, those coastal locations are really important because oh, during yeah. the summertime, how many times are you on the beach and you see aircraft doing joy flights, you see people That's doing it. scenics, um, if you are around those coastal holiday towns, um, eyes out on stalks, fair dinkum. You really need to keep <laughs> your, your, your head on a swivel. They're, they're, you know, there's shark patrols, there could be drones, there's joy flights, there's often parachuting, there's all sorts of stuff. So, so just think a bit strategically about before you go flying, what are some of the things that I'm likely to run into here and, and plan accordingly? Anyway. No, that's a great point, Tim. And, and um, you know, for example, if you fly Victor One uh, off Sydney and you haven't done it because most people like to do that in the summer, um, this is an important, this is a great time long before you go to uh, brush up on the procedures, know which side uh, you're going to stay uh, of the lane, uh, make sure that you've got all the required equipment. Um, those preparations really important uh, in the coastal areas. Um, I did. Uh, I just want to quickly mention parachutists. Um, aircraft conducting parachute operations increase in the warmer weather, again, because it's a nicer time to do it. Uh, and when that happens, it's really important. If you're approaching a coastal town, uh, an aerodrome where there are parachutists uh, operating, uh, in fact, a town anywhere where there are parachutists, always speak up. Make sure the drop, the drop pilot knows you're there, knows where you are, has an estimate for when you think you're going to be in the circuit and make absolutely certain that you're sure that there will be no parachutes in the air when you reach uh, anywhere near that uh, drop zone. And it might mean you have to say to the uh, people on board, you know, we're just going to have a quick little look at this bay over here. Uh, it's always very interesting to fly around this island. Uh, and that's a nice way to burn, say, seven minutes while uh, the parachutists complete their task. Um, 
I just want to quickly talk about thunderstorms and you know there's a whole bunch of different types of thunderstorms and let's not worry too much about them but you need to be aware that they take different uh, forms and flavors and even the average common garden variety east coast sydney thunderstorm in summer is a very hazardous thing uh, with wind shear turbulence icing hail all sorts of things um, that can appear and uh, similarly, we also need to be thinking about turbulence. So turbulence caused by uh, convective heating um, of the earth and the converging air masses in cloudless skies will still occur. And with cloud, it actually gets amplified because the latent heat that's released during the condensation of a small shower, maybe not even where you're flying, uh, can create uh, lifting and further updrafts um, that will um, uh, cause uh, considerable turbulence. And of course, if there's uh, cumulonimbus clouds associated with thunderstorms, you can expect severe and extreme turbulence. Go nowhere near it, 20 miles, 25 miles, 30 miles for general aviation, small general aviation aircraft is not unreasonable at all. The danger is not just in the cloud because there's both an updraft and a downdraft. And uh, those uh, updrafts and downdrafts uh, can create extreme situations that can well and truly exceed the um, climb uh, and uh, speed control capabilities that you might have in a smaller aircraft. Orographic mechanical turbulence obviously associated with uh, air moving fast over hills and frontal zones, which will always have turbulence attached to them. So um, that pretty just... much covers... Go on, Tim. <laughs> yeah, sorry, mate. Um, just before we finish on turbulence, um, I did the wet season seminar earlier this year up in the top end, and you know we've had some terrible accidents up there where you know young pilots have got caught in trouble and even you know torn the wings off aircraft. But um, when it comes to turbulence, please, your your aircraft flight manual is your friend. Have a good understanding of what your manoeuvring speed is. Um, understand what VA is, what it actually means aerodynamically and physically, and respect it. Don't go barreling through, you know, um, uh, moderate or severe turbulence with everything firewalled. You know, respect that VA speed. Know it and and, and adhere to it. Something else. And, and and if I could say, Tim, just before I hand over, that that is such a great point that you've just made. The, um, and, and pilots should remember, of course, that VA varies with weight and it's yep. not often uh, in the way that you expect. So a lightly loaded aircraft is actually got a lower, a lightly loaded aeroplane will have a lower VA and uh, requires um, a considerably lower speeds when dealing with the turbulence. Um, so it's in, very important, as Tim said, the aircraft flight manual is your friend. Um, set the speed appropriately, be prepared to slow down, and also be prepared to slow down in summertime in the circuits as well. Um, when approaching an aerodrome, we don't need to go in flat out. Um, get the speed right back so you've got plenty of time to see, you've got easy manoeuvrability and control of the aircraft. Um, there are um, some critical tips as well. And with that, Tim, I'm going to hand back to you. All right. Thank you very much. I'll just take control of this, this whiz-bang talky machine. Um, <laughs> nice photos there, mate. Some of your photos are lovely. Um, it's always good to yeah. it's always good to have some nice shots. There's a there's a few there. The one on the bottom left is between the layers on the way into the North yeah. Island in New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, the one on the right is um, morning summertime fog uh, over Broken Bay uh, in New South Wales. Yep. And the one down the right um, is on approach to um, a Victorian coastal. Actually, I think it was on the way into Mount Gambier. I might be wrong, um, but it's down in the south of uh, Victoria yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, the uh, be aware that you know sea fog and things like that can still come and get you even in summertime. I tell you, um, rodeo. Okay, to wrap up, just a few key points to leave with you before we all charge off on on our summer holidays. Um, nice little photo there, and thank you to Andy um, who jumped in the comments a little earlier, um, talking about the uh, the importance of just staying away from active bushfires. Um, because you do not want to hinder the emergency services doing what they have to do. It's a challenging enough operation as it is managing um, aerial work activities in uh, in limited visibility without people charging through. 
So it's just a few key points. Um, first of all, Andrew, thank you so much for giving us your time and your certainly considerable expertise. And it really is very good for us to be able to tap into subject matter experts such as yourself, Andy, and um, and partner with us um, because really we're all we're all in this boat together, and collaboration um, is, is is vital. So what do we want to take away? Okay, what do we want to take? From away from this final webinar of the year. What are some of the main things we need to consider when we go flying in the Australian summer? Well, just to wrap it up, I hope you have been convinced now that there are hazards that are quite unique to flying in the summer season, or are at the very least more prevalent than what we are like to, likely to experience at other times of the year. So yes, they, it, summer does come with its own unique hazards. I suppose what we need to do as aviators is make a deliberate decision to stop and have a real think about what has the potential to impact on our safety of flight during these hot summer months. And how are we going to manage these risks that these hazards represent to our safety, both as individuals, as individual pilots, but also if you fly as part of an organisation or a flying school, how are you going to manage these hazards as an organisation? One of the things I recommend to a lot of companies I talk to is that before there's a big change in season, which is usually coming into summer and then coming into winter, just sit down with everyone. Just go into a classroom or a meeting room, drag out the whiteboard and just sit down and spitball this stuff. So everyone's on the same page about what has the potential to bite us and how we're going to manage it. Um, the other thing, proactive risk assessment. Don't be a victim. Be proactive, especially in those pre-flight stages. And we can do this by being really disciplined in our preparation, because as Andrew said earlier, th that process might start several days before your flight, or depending on what you're doing, it might it might even start several weeks before your flight. That the more you can actually do in the risk management space while you're on the ground before you get in the air, the better prepared that you're going to be to manage the challenges of what is really quite a dynamic environment when we get airborne, especially in the hot summer season because the performance of both our aircraft and also ourselves as humans, as individuals, they certainly can be compromised in hot weather. And we know that hot and humid weather can also impact on the performance of our aircraft, but also ourselves as well. And also be kind to yourself. You know, we're not mm. robots. Give ourselves every opportunity to make the best decisions that we can, because your passengers and your families, they certainly deserve no less. And, I, I, you know, that big emphasis I like that Andy mentioned earlier was the flight manual. It really is your friend. If you haven't picked up the performance charts or done a weight and balance or uh, a takeoff distance calculation from first principles, if you haven't done that for a while or you only do it when it comes time for flight reviews and you're a bit rusty, drag out the flight manual, have a play with this thing, find out the impact that density altitude has on the performance of your aircraft. Have a look at what impact temperature has on the performance of your aircraft. Those types of things are vital. Um, even things like weight and balance, really know them and really practice them. I think, I think that's some really good info there. Um, and um, yes, Andy, thank you, Andy. You put up that um, that little poster there. Don't fly near bushfires. And there's some uh, smoke reducers visibility plan ahead. And there's some very good info in there. And I think, Andy, you said crewed aircraft should remain five miles and at least five miles and 3,000 feet AGL away from fire boundaries. Um, and uh, there, there's some there's some really, really good info in there. And what have we got here? Uh, we've seen a big increase in firefighting helicopters using airports all around the country. A good reminder to understand how helicopter circuit behavior does differ from fixed wing, and that's important. Helicopters do not have to conform to the normal standard fixed wing circuit pattern. They do have dispensations under part 91 to come in and out in a, in a different way, shape and form. So just be aware. A lot of these firefighting helicopters are large machines with significant downwash. So things like wake turbulence and things like that need to be considered when we're operating in the vicinity um, of those types of machines. So they're the key points. So a quick final gratuitous pledge, um, a plug really for our Pilot Safety Hub. I think we're coming now, Jane, to the second year of this. Um, 
uh, we've just had this uh, year two, your safety is in your hands because at the end of the day, as pilots in command, we are responsible for our own safety. Um, and it's up to all pilots, whether you fly professionally or recreationally, to take responsibility for your own safety. There's a myriad of stuff out there that we can all plug into. We look at operations at non-controlled aerodromes. We look at operations at controlled aerodromes in the Pilot Safety Hub. We look at flight planning and weather and forecasting. There's links to previous webinars, podcasts, checklists, and all sorts of great information. Um, so really, that's it for 2023. Our next webinar will most likely get going in the first couple of months of next year. So before you jump off and, 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 and head away today, please feel free to jump on the chat and put in what suggestions you'd like for future webinars. We're always after new ideas for both topics and also guest presenters such as Andy. I'd like to just say thank you to everyone who's joined us this year and who has really gone out and promoted this resource to their friends, their colleagues and flying schools and other organisations. A big thank you to all our guests who've joined us and given their time and expertise. We've had guests from the Bureau of Meteorology, Air Services Australia, the Royal Flying Doctor. We've had a big, big cross section of interest of industry join us and we're certainly grateful for their the passion that they bring to aviation safety and their willingness to share information. So never, ever, ever be afraid to aim for excellence. And hopefully this webinar series can continue just to, to fuel that. And look, you, you, you know, Blind Freddy will tell you that it has not been a good year in aviation safety. This year has been a particularly, um, uh, a particularly bad year for aviation safety. So we, it's a bit like painting the Sydney Harbour Bridge, guys. We've got to still keep chipping away. And this is not the be all and end all, but it's a vital little part of that puzzle. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, you will get that Credly badge that you can um, add to your signature blocks if you hang around for the end of the seminar. And um, we're getting lots of great feedback there from um, our guests saying thank you, thank you, thank you. We certainly enjoy putting it together. We certainly hope that it does um, fulfil that that little safety that little safety niche for your ongoing professional development. So um, without any further ado, um, have a great summer period. Stay safe. We'll see you again for our webinar series, which will be starting early next year. All the best.